Okay, there we go. So um, let's start by having each of the panel members introduce yourselves and give, give us an overview about your frontline experiences with COVID-19. Let's start with Kelly Hathorne and continue on in the order mentioned above. Awesome. So I'm Kelly Hathorne. It's nice to virtually meet you guys or to see you guys for those of you that I know. Um, so I was a member of the DWS class of 2009 and then I uh, graduated from Duke Medical School in 2014. And then I moved actually to Boston six years ago to do my internal medicine residency training at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is one of the hospitals affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Um, so after my residency training, I actually stayed here in Boston uh, to do my gastroenterology fellowship and bariatric endoscopy fellowship, which is finally almost done. Um, and I'm actually heading back down towards North Carolina uh, at the end of June, which I'm super excited about. So I have one more year of training in advanced endoscopy, um, which I will be doing at a school down the road that I will not name. Um, but I'm very excited, like I said, to be back in North Carolina and closer to a lot of you guys and for all the current players, super excited to be able to come out and watch you guys play a lot more than I've been able to in the last few years. So that'll be great. Um, if sort of all that stuff that I just said about my training makes absolutely no sense to you, don't worry. Um, but I am always happy to answer your questions for those of you that are medically bound. I am um, sort of in terms of so like my overall COVID experiences. So most of what I do this year in my day to day is actually outpatient work or elective procedures and clinic visits. So when the COVID pandemic hit, my typical day-to-day -day life, just like many of yours, actually also came to a bit of a halt. Um, so I went from doing upper endoscopies and colonoscopies and all these like really cool procedures day in and day out to being at home and doing a lot of virtual clinics and in research and other things. Um, and for someone who likes procedures and likes the social aspect of being with my patients and my colleagues, that was incredibly tough for me, just like I know it was for a lot of you guys that have been stuck at home and have missed out on a lot of really cool life things. Um, so eventually, when cases really started surging in Boston, um, they did ask for volunteers to help out in the COVID intensive care unit. Um, so fortunately, as someone that's otherwise healthy and did have that medical training, um, I was, of course, happy to help um, and volunteered and have done a couple of shifts now in the COVID intensive care units, which um, really was taking care of the sickest of the sick patients in our hospital. Um, so critical care work is part of my residency training, but I hadn't done it in about three years. Uh, so that was a little overwhelming at times. But again, I was happy to be there and to be able to help. And I think it was a super eye-opening experience because trying to grasp the severity of this illness from home is nearly impossible, even for those of us that are medically trained and that like have seen really sick patients. Um, it wasn't really until I was there and, and witnessing it that I could really see the impact it was having, not just on the patients, but their families and on, on healthcare workers as well. Um, you know, I think many of the patients we're caring for, and it, it, the news is correct, they're young. Um, our unit, the oldest patient we had at one point was in their 60s, which is not old. Um, we had many, many patients on like the most amount of life support we can give, which is something called ECMO, um, which I'll spare you the details on, but it's complicated to begin with and it becomes even more complicated when families can't come in and you're talking over the phone or over iPads and you're trying to convey the severity of what's going on sort of all virtually. Um, so yeah, but I, I also think that I was, again, fortunate to be able to be there and to be healthy and to be able to help. Um, and the hospital really is coming together sort of to care for each other and for our patients, which I think was really refreshing. All right, guys, um, my name's Kendall Bradley. Um, I graduated in 2011, so I played a couple of years with Kelly, um, and then was also a year behind her in med school, so I graduated med school in 2015. Um, and then actually stayed at Duke, and now I'm in my fifth and chief year of uh, orthopedic surgery. I finished in about six weeks, which is a little bit scary. Um, and I'm uh, moving to San Francisco to do a fellowship in sports medicine uh, in the middle of July. Um, I know some of you guys from, um, I was fortunate over the past five years to be one of the um, resident uh, team physicians for um, women's soccer, and then also uh, worked with some of the other Duke sports teams, basketball, football, and also North Carolina Central. So I've spent a lot of time doing team coverage um, in, in those type of roles. Um, in terms of COVID-19 and coronavirus, 
Um, North Carolina has been pretty lucky um, if you look at the scope of things compared to a Boston, New York, Detroit, um, and we have not been overwhelmed in that setting. So uh, we've been lucky. Like Kelly, most of my work is um, outpatient and elective surgeries, um, but we do take care of trauma patients, and that's probably where I've had the most exposure to COVID patients is uh, either through the ED, um, taking care of patients who have orthopedic emergencies who just happen to have coronavirus or um, patients who unfortunately, um, this is the trauma season in North Carolina, so our trauma service volume has gone up. Um, and with it, we've had patients who have had COVID-19. So that primarily impacts how patients go to sleep, what type of protective wear we wear in the operating room or do procedures with. Um, but again, uh, I have not worked in a, in a COVID unit and currently I'm working at the, the VA um, across the street um, from, from the main Duke hospital where um, They've been they've been pretty well spared. So most of the cases in North Carolina, as people might know, are coming primarily out of our prison system in Butner, or some nursing um, homes up in the way. And, and those patients who are really sick have been transferred to Duke, but being taken care of our medicine by our medicine type colleagues. Um, and then my fiance and Kelly's failed to mention her boyfriend's an anesthesiologist, so I'm sure he's had some pretty um, dramatic experiences. But my fiance works in urgent care um, here at Duke and um, as Duke has adjusted to trying to treat and triage um, COVID patients, she's worked in some of the respiratory care centers, um, which primarily deal with treating patients outpatient with coronavirus, trying to keep them out of the hospital um, and testing through that. So that's, I hear about those patients uh, at home certainly, but uh, fortunately I've been relatively minimal in taking care of those patients myself. Hi guys, I'm Meg Montgomery. Um, unfortunately for me, but fortunately for all of you, I did not play women's soccer. It would have been a much less talented team if you had people like me playing, but I was always a fan. Um, and congrats to you guys for staying so well connected and supporting each other through times like this. Um, I graduated from Duke in 2006. I was a biology major and had a, got a certificate in health policy. So I've always been interested in sort of the intersection between science and policy and politics. Um, after Duke, I moved to New York um, and got my master's in public health and health policy management at Columbia and went on to work for about 10 years um, in hospitals, primarily in New York Presbyterian, a uh, large hospital system in New York City. So while I was at New York Presbyterian, I had several different roles in operations and strategy and finance. Um, but one of the things I got to do was work on the Ebola preparedness team um, there, which um, was in 2014. And we actually had a, a physician on staff who, who had been in, in West Africa and got infected. Um, and so we did a lot of contingency planning, things like facilities and um, you know, workforce surges and, and sort of modeling all of that out. And though the pathogen in COVID-19 is very different than Ebola and it presents differently, um, some of those same themes are, are very applicable now. Um, so that was a great experience that I happened to have. Um, and then about two years ago, my husband, who's actually also an orthopedic surgeon, um, and I moved back to Minneapolis where I'm from. And so for the last just about a year, I've been working um, as the policy and outreach liaison for Congressman, uh, U.S. Congressman Dean Phillips in the third district of Minnesota. So in my role, part of what I do is I cover healthcare. So I'm responsible for sort of synthesizing what's in policy generally. Um, and right now it's all COVID related and much of it is healthcare related. Um, and so both really understanding what's in all these relief packages that are going through um, Congress right now and how they would impact constituents in our district. Um, and then additionally, I am the liaison with federal agencies for healthcare. I also cover environment, energy, and agriculture. Um, but so uh, agencies like CMS and FDA and increasingly FEMA um, are you know, the agencies I'm talking with every day trying to figure out uh, how implementation is going on the policies that have been passed um, and then sort of addressing constituent concerns. So. Um, I think all congressional offices are kind of all COVID all the time right now, um, regardless of what issue area you're covering, but certainly it has been um, an extremely busy couple months. Um, and there's, you know, I'll talk a little bit more in question and answer about things that have passed so far and things we're, we're looking towards, but um, it's, it's going to be, I think, a busy couple of years. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bridget Arnold, and I played at Duke in the 90s, which probably, I mean, who was even born in 1990? Can I see some hands? Oh my God. Well, yeah, I see Deb, I see Elaine, I see Casey, awesome. Okay, uh, because most of you were not even, 
uh, a glimpse when I was a Duke, but I finished in 94. I was a defender. First, was it, was it your first coaching job, Carla? I think it was like big time job. Yes, it was. Okay. So we had a blast. Carla was something else. If you like her now, just imagine how much fun she was at 25. Um, anyway, so I, uh, I graduated from Duke. I moved to Seattle, which at the time, most people in my family thought was basically Alaska. Um, it was not really on the map yet, but I got a job at Microsoft um, in the early, you know, 96, I guess it was. I had a couple of, uh, I did a, an agency stint before Microsoft um, and spent uh, about 13 years at the company doing a variety of marketing roles, uh, mostly consumer facing. Um, but that's where I got to work closely with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. Um, and the rest of the executive team. And when Bill told us he wanted to switch his full-time focus to really concentrate on global health um, and philanthropy and education in the US, um, I decided to make the jump um, and follow him to that second career, um, which basically meant I was sitting in his practice. Um, and that would have been, let's see, my son was one, so that's like 10 years ago now. Um, and so, uh, you know, COVID has been something else. I mean, it's, it's um, having been to Africa and South Asia, you know, um, more than 30 times uh, over the last 15 years for work. Um, and you see these devastated health systems that barely have what they need every day. Uh, and then you uh, come back home and it's a stark contrast. And suddenly we find ourselves with a pandemic in our backyard. And so it's, it's, um, it's striking, it's stunning, it's sobering. Um, and uh, it, as, as, uh, as you said, Meg, it's gonna be a, a tough couple of years. Um, but my role with Bill primarily is communications. Um, so when you see him in the press, on a stage, um, on TV, uh, that's generally me partnering with him to help him communicate things that he thinks are important for people to understand about usually pretty complicated issues. Um, and so with COVID, obviously, um, we've been out there quite a bit trying to fill what has felt like a very big vacuum of um, poor information, bad information, whether it's intentional or otherwise, to try to help people understand some of the basic facts, keep themselves safe, um, and, and you know, do their part wherever they are. Thank you very much. So amazing backgrounds. I'm excited to dive a little bit deeper into it all. Um, so going to start by asking the two healthcare workers a handful of medical related questions, both to Kelly Hathorne and Kendall Bradley. So first, Kelly, um, can you talk about the actual process of getting a test? If someone has serious symptoms, what can or should they do? Yeah, so I think honestly, like to start, um, one thing to acknowledge when trying to tackle this question is that this is going to differ city to state to city and definitely state by state. Um, and it is constantly changing. Um, even now it is still changing. Um, but I think the most important thing to know is that if anyone develops symptoms or comes into contact with someone that's a known positive, the most important thing that you can do is either call your primary care doctor or call the public health department and ask them what your local testing practices and recommendations are. A lot of patients really do have mild symptoms and oftentimes their recommendations really may be just sort of stay, to stay at home and to watch your symptoms and to see how you do. Obviously acknowledging that if at any point your symptoms are severe or you're really not doing well, calling 911 or going to the emergency room is of course the best option. And, you know, at least here in Boston, and I think most other places now, if you end up with symptoms in the emergency room, they will be able to test you. Um, otherwise, you know, like here in Boston, again, we've set up a drive through clinic, like I think a lot of other places have. There's a lot of COVID clinics that have been developed, again, both here in Boston and elsewhere. Um, so that even if you're not quite sick enough that you have to go to the emergency room, there are still ways that you're able to get tested. But again, I think the most important thing just to say and say and say again is that if you think you have symptoms, you should call. Don't just show up places. Don't just go to the doctor or go, you know, um, into your normal clinics because one of the biggest things is the risk of exposure. Um, and so people need to be prepared for you to come and they need to have the right gear on. I know PPE is like the thing nowadays, but it really is true. And it really does protect the healthcare workers and other people that would come into contact with you if they know that you're 
you're coming. Um, and then I think, you know, just to sort of say, um, cause I'm not sure how many of you have ever actually needed a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, so that's what they're using to test, um, for COVID. And, um, if you've never had the pleasure of having one, uh, consider yourself lucky. Um, but basically what they need to do, so this is primarily sort of a respiratory virus is the way to think about it. And so they need to test your respiratory mucosa or membranes. And so in order to get an accurate or an adequate specimen, they really need to push the, the swab very deep into your nasal sort of cavity, I guess you could say. Um, and so you know, one of my colleagues actually had to get three of them done. Um, and he said, literally, by the end, it felt like they were stirring up his brain. Like that is how far they're going in there. Um, and not telling you that to scare you, but I personally like to be aware of what I'm going in for. So when they're talking about these pharyngeal swab talking, uh, and it is something where to get a good specimen, they really have to get a good depth. So just be aware if you're heading in for one. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're definitely not fun. I had one early March, but, um, second question to Kendall, how would you describe the availability of testing today? What are hospitals saying is the number of tests the U.S. needs to, um, per day to be able to reopen the economy? Yeah, I'll kind of echo what, um, Kelly said, um, you know, the testing availability, it's pretty widely available, um, at this point, but some of that, again, is going to depend on what city you are in. Obviously, if you're in a major metropolitan area or even a place like Durham, you're going to have better access to that. There are some places that are offering free testing. Um, some pharmacies are doing it, but again, I wouldn't just go just because you want to see, um, I'd have a reason to go before you go get that test. And then just remember that the tests are also a little bit different. Um, you know, in terms of we, we're still not quite sure of the accuracy of all these testing. So, you know, false positives, false negatives are a real thing. So um, I would say that most of these tests haven't gone through the kind of rigorous process that the FDA normally takes to undergo testing. So um, just be aware that not all tests are, are the same. If you are going to get tested, make sure you go to a, a you know, a, a well-known uh, medical center or someplace that at least has some um experience with that type of thing. Um, in terms of number of tests to reopen the economy, I think that's more of a political question than a medical one, um, to be quite honest. Um, and, and I don't think we know. I think the thing you're going to hear from Kelly and I again and again is we don't know because we don't know enough about this virus. It's a new virus. Um, we don't have a good treatment for it. Um, it unfortunately appears to be incredibly contagious um, and most people do okay. But obviously some people are getting very, very sick and we actually have a pretty high death uh, toll at this point from this pandemic. So um, I don't think we can put a, we'll want to see the numbers of cases go down. We'll want to see them plateau. Um, and, you know, as we start to open up the economy again, we'll undoubtedly see an increase in cases again. So um, I don't think we're ready to say that in, you know, a couple months we'll be ready to reopen everything, but I think you're going to see a push of that. But again, that's, I don't want to get into politics over here, but um, I think it's more of a political one than a medical question. Got it. Um, so Kelly, Kendall started to touch on this, but when do you think that science will have effective treatment drugs? And what do you think the timeline is for the U.S. to be ready to distribute a vaccine to the general um, population? So again, Libby with the tough questions. Um, I don't think we necessarily know yet. Um, and I'm definitely not an expert in this and it's complicated and it's also rapidly evolving. But what I will say is that they researchers around the world are working tirelessly to find a treatment and to figure out what is going to be the safest and the most effective option for our patients. Um, you know, one of the infectious disease doctors here who is a part of all the trials, I mean, it did not matter if I was on a day shift or a night shift or what time I was in the hospital, I can assure you I would run into him at least once or twice a shift. Um, so people are working on it. I think the one that you guys have probably heard the most about is remdesivir, uh, which is this antiviral drug. And I do think there have been some promising results that have come out. Um, there was one study out of China, and there's been another big study from the United States that showed um, basically that it, it's associated with a faster time to recovery. Um, and I think the news outlets really grabbed hold of remdesivir being, being this miracle drug, but I think what they don't really highlight is that there was actually no change in mortality. 
So it may make people better a little faster, um, but overall sort of the death rates were not significantly different between the two groups. And I think, again, it's promising, but we don't know yet. Um, there's been a lot of other sort of press um, and promising drugs or therapies, this convalescent plasma. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking the antibodies from the blood um, in the blood from patients that have recovered and they're trying to use that to fight the active virus in patients that are still sick and again very promising but not widely available at all um, we actually I haven't been in the ICU in about a week or so but we were not offering that here at the Brigham which is one of the biggest hospitals in Boston um, so I think that's important to know. And then, you know, I think like the Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine and there was all these other things and everyone was trying all these new therapies. And I think for the most part, a lot of them have shown more, more harm than good. And we're actually not using a lot of them. Um, so I think time will tell. I think even once we find a really effective therapy, then it becomes a supply and demand issue. So not only do we need an effective therapy, but then we need enough of it to treat the people that need it. Um, so that's a whole nother issue. Um, and then I think for vaccines, I, for those of you that know me and for those of you that don't, but have listened to me talk now for about 10 minutes, you probably can tell I'm a pretty peppy, optimistic person. Uh, I wish I could be that way in terms of the timing of the vaccines, but I, I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. I think the thing that to highlight about coronavirus, which is a little bit nitty gritty about the science, but it's, it's a single stranded RNA virus, which means sort of in simple terms, it can mutate quickly. Um, and so it's a really hard virus to target, first of all. So number one, you have to be able to target it effectively. And then number two, you actually have to produce enough vaccines and go through a very regimented clinical sort of phasing out system to make sure that this is actually safe before you ever get to a stage that this is gonna be rolled out like the annual flu vaccines that we're more accustomed to. So I think that many, 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 many months, if not years, until that's going to truly be something that we're, we're offering to everyone. My dad, Kelly, my dad's been asking for my plasma every day, so I'll be happy to report to him that it's not an easy process. <laughs> it's not. I mean, it, it does happen for sure. Uh, but like we had, I mean, it was so sad. I mean, we would have patients and their fa our patients' families, not really the patients, but the family is like essentially begging, saying like, well, we're reading about this plasma. And, and if you can get it and offer it, it's, it seems to work, but it's not everywhere, which I think is important to be aware of. Got it. Well, thank you very much. Um, Kendall, next question for you. Can you talk about the antibody tests? What are they? How do you get one? And why might it be useful? And then lastly, what do studies say about how long immunity could potentially last? Yeah, so, you know, when we're talking about testing, your testing really comes down to three different things. So you can test for like the, the virus or viral load, you'll see that. Um, which is a ma oftentimes a PCR based. Um, so you take a little piece of, of DNA, replicate it, and look for it. You can test for an antigen, um, so something that the virus produces, or your antibodies is, is now the hot topic. And, and that's essentially what your body produces. Um, I am not an immunologist, and, um, but um, you know, essentially what your body produces when it's been exposed to an antigen, which is, you know, or a virus. Um, and People create antibodies to a lot of different things, but the question is, what do the antibodies do for us? So you can think of like the chicken pox, which most people have had, or at least had a vaccine for, and people have antibodies to that and they can't get sick again. Um, or um, just the common cold, we have lots of antibodies around our body, but we can get sick again and again and um, get sick every year. So I think the thing about antibody tests, number one, they are not widely available right now. Um, it's primarily being used from a research perspective. Um, and we don't know if having an antibody allows you to um, have immunity from uh, getting coronavirus again. So I think we're a like the vaccine, um, which is one way to kind of develop antibodies in your, in your body. I think we are a long way away from knowing whether or not antibodies are um, going to prevent you from getting sick again. Um, it just means if you have positive antibodies that you've been exposed and your body um, uh, essentially made a memory of the fact that you've been exposed to a virus, um, to put it um, kind of in a simple way. So um, in terms of how long will immunity last, again, I, I, we don't know if this is going to be a lifelong immunity, you know, if you've been exposed, if that means you can't get sick again, or if you can get sick again the next time you get exposed. And every virus is a little bit different. And like Kelly said, 
Um, viruses have the ability to rapidly mutate, um, which is what makes making vaccines um, incredibly difficult or treatments incredibly difficult. If you think about the hot viruses we talk about in the world, um, it's difficult to target treatments to them because they mutate so rapidly. So a lot of research, um, when research shut down, uh, basic science research kind of shut down for a while in a lot of places um, to try to um, have social distancing. A lot of labs turned to doing coronavirus or COVID-19 research. Um, a lot of our labs at Duke, even our orthopedic labs did. So there's a lot of research going on, but research takes time because you, it needs to be um, proven again and again before you can develop into something that's clinically relevant. So I think not to give you a non-answer, but we don't know what those antibody tests are going to mean long-term going forward, but I wouldn't jump to get one because I just don't think it's clinically relevant at this point. Interesting. Um, so Kelly, next question for you. Um, I acknowledge that the coronavirus is not a new and completely unknown sickness at this point, but it can't hurt to further educate um, ourselves to make sure that we are all taking, taking the right precautions. Um, what are some symptoms we should be concerned about? And what are some basic um, items we should all have in our household to be prepared? Um, so I think a super important thing to point out here is that the symptoms sort of that most people think or know about are fever and dry cough and this difficulty breathing. Um, but these really aren't the only symptoms that occur and are not the only things to look out for. So patients can have headaches, um, muscle pain, body sort of shaking chills, even sore throat. Um, one symptom or sort of set of symptoms that got a lot of press was the new loss of taste or smell, but it, it is very real. Um, and then some patients even come in with sort of more in my realm of specialty gastrointestinal complaints. So um, my group actually here at Brigham, we just published a study in one of the gastroenterology journals. Um, and we looked at all of our patients that were hospitalized here, which was in the 300s or so range at the time, and actually 61% of those patients had GI symptoms, so poor appetite, diarrhea, nausea, most commonly being the symptoms that they were reporting, and actually one in five of the patients hospitalized here came in with primarily GI symptoms. So it, it's now sort of actually even in the CDC guidelines to be aware that this really isn't just fevers, cough, breath, difficulty breathing, this like really causes a whole slew of symptoms and just need to be aware of that. Um, and then I really appreciate the second part of that. So in terms of what to have in the household, I mean, I think while it may sound silly, the most important way that you can protect yourself are to wash your hands and to clean surfaces that a lot of other people are touching. And if you develop symptoms to self quarantine and really don't be around other people. Um, so I think, you know, I, everyone rushed out for the toilet paper, but you know, hand soaps and hand sanitizers and cleaning supplies are all super important. And very small question, but do they still recommend Tylenol over ibuprofen when you have it? So no, it's so the the very early data came out saying that NSAIDs were pretty were bad and were associated with worse outcomes. There was a lot of back and forth on that and the basically it has not played out to be a significant risk factor. Um, there are a lot of other reasons, especially as a GI doctor, that I would tell you to avoid NSAIDs if possible. Um, but overall, um, I think that they're safe if you need them. Got it. Okay, perfect. So then the last um, question for the healthcare section, Kendall, outside of the obvious importance of social dis distancing, what do you guys wish more Americans were doing right now and what else can we be doing to help? Um, I, I would say, I mean, staying home, wear a mask when you're out in public. These are all part of the CDC recommendations. I would follow, try to follow CDC recommendations. I think it, a lot of those things are really simple. Um, I know that people had a lot of things probably planned this spring um, and summer and fall. Uh, my wedding got moved because of coronavirus. So I, I get that this is affecting people's lives and their um, jobs and all of that. Um, sorry, Harper. Uh, no. Um, but you know, stay at home, wash your hands. Like Kelly said, listen to scientists. I don't know if you guys know a lot of basic scientists, but they're really not out there to like try to make your life miserable or ruin your fun or um, keep you from doing your job. They're really focused on the science of this. Um, so try to focus on that rather than, um, the internet or Facebook or Instagram scientists. Um, they, these people are 
um, brilliant. They've spent their whole careers doing this. So they um, know about this, not me personally as an orthopedic surgeon, but um, the immunologists, the virologists, infectious disease doctors, the medicine doctors, they are all doing their best to try to keep the public safe. So please listen to the scientists and not maybe the pundits as much. Well, thank you both Kendall and Kelly. Um, now we're going to move on to the policy side with Meg Montgomery. Um, so first, Meg, what policies are federal agencies putting in place right now to help, the, to help support and reopen the economy? Sure. So in the last two months, so since the beginning of March, um, Congress has passed actually four separate relief packages totaling $3 trillion. So you know, for a legislative body that's not known for being particularly quick acting, um, there has certainly been a lot of movement, um, you know, bipartisan movement. Those packages passed almost unanimously um, and were signed off by the president. So you know, a few different levels of sort of economic relief for the individual. The big things in those packages were both the um, cash relief payments. So that's the up to $1,200 per individual, which is supposed to be, you know, an individual relief, but also a stimulus for the economy as people spend that money. Um, additionally, uh, expanded unemployment insurance. So that's the extra $600 per week on top of your state unemployment benefits. Um, and that goes through the end of July currently, though there is conversation about extending that um, expanded unemployment as well. And then um, emergency family and medical leave. So for most employers, they're now required to give um, eight, up to 80 hours um, for coronavirus or COVID related if you are a family member is feeling ill, um, which is important as we try to um, you know, keep people, especially symptomatic people home. Um, for large corporations, the big thing that has been passed congressionally is uh, over $450 billion of extra lending from the Federal Reserve. So that's a way for um, the Fed to infuse cash into large corporations. There are also some um, industry-specific sort of bailouts. So the, the most well-known one is the $58 billion for the airline industry. Um, and then, you know, on the small business side, the biggest thing is there were two different allocations of money for the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. So that's now up to $670 billion. So that is for small businesses, so less than 500 people, um, who keep, keep their payroll intact for the most part, 75% or more of their payroll intact and they're eligible for PPP, which is a forgivable loan. Um, there's also some smaller uh, economic impact disaster loans um, and some payroll tax credits. Um, implementation of all of these things is challenging um, and has been challenging. Um, and you know, I know our office and many other offices are looking at sort of the gaps. So a big one is mid-sized employers. So 501 sort of 1,000 employers um, or employees, I'm sorry. You know, they're not big enough to qualify for the big infusions from the Fed, and they're too big to qualify for PPP, so that's, that's a big hole. Um, also, nonprofits, you know, there were some, like, 501c3s were eligible, 501c6 and 7s weren't. Um, there are certain, like, things that were done during rulemaking that um, left people out, and so there's, there's talk about trying to further expand those programs as well. Thank you very much. So, um, next question, what will reopening possibly look like? What will the next two months, six months, 12 months possibly look like for our lives? Yeah, um, I wish I could give a really succinct answer on this one. Um, I think I would become a very wealthy and well-known person, but um, you know, I will just sort of echo what Kelly was saying before about testing. I mean, I think it's gonna look really different in different places, in different states and cities. Um, it's gonna be, you know, I know a lot of governors and local officials are talking about it being a dial and not a switch and it being, you know, turned up and down and not on and off. So. Um, you know, trying a little bit of relaxation of guidelines um, to open the economy back up. Um, if we can keep infections down, that's wonderful. If they start to rise again, then you might have to turn the dial back. Um, you know, I think um, I don't envy Bridget trying to communicate in this time. I think it's just, it's, it's all very confusing. I mean, it's confusing even to the experts and that's, that's a real struggle. You know, guidelines change all the time as, as we learn more and science changes. And so, you know, what was good information two weeks ago might not be great information now. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. I mean, I think widespread testing, um, 
is certainly something we need. But I think, you know, when we talk about the tests that are available now, we've come a long way. But, you know, these aren't like the rapid testing that people, I think, in their mind want to have and would really change the paradigm. You know, if you could test yourself in 10 minutes later, no, if you have coronavirus and that would allow you to, you know, walk into a mall without fearing that you would infect people, that's really different than, you know, going to a drive through test and getting called three or four days later and hearing that you're negative, especially when, to Kendall's point, we don't, you know, always know the false positive and false negative and the sensitivity and specificity of some of these tests. So, you know, widespread testing, certainly contact tracing, just basic public health. When there's a positive, you need to be able to get to everyone who's had contact with that positive. Um, and then, you know, really good quarantine and isolation measures. So, I think that's something you know other countries have done differently than the US. And so when someone is a positive, you know, really ensuring that they're fully quarantined and isolated um, is something that's, you know, di it's difficult, but it can be done. And so, um, you know, if that's something we should explore as well. And I, you know, I think the vaccine, I you know, agree with everything Kelly said. I also wish I could be a little bit more optimistic. Um, Apart from the vaccine, you know, even in places where there have been widespread infections, like in New York, Libya, as you know, the testing there shows that there's still only like 20 to 30 percent um, of people have had COVID-19. So to get to a herd immunity level, we're just, you know, a ways away from that, um, which is, you know, fortunate that that we didn't have a bigger peak, um, but makes like a full reopening of the economy something that is probably going to, you know, it's just going to be probably over a year until it, it, it's it's back on. Um, and along those lines, if after reopening the curve of incidence rises, do you think we will revert back to a massive quarantine like we're currently exper experiencing? So I don't anticipate that there will be like a national lockdown again, you know, back to, to Kelly's point, I think it's going to be different in different places. We're in a different position now because we do have more testing. And so I think that the ability to identify and localize where outbreaks are happening will allow it to, you know, not sort of be a, a national lockdown. But I, I certainly could see, you know, different pockets of the country or different areas having to go, you know, full quarantine again. Got it. And any view on when big gatherings like sporting events will be back in the picture? I'm sure this is an important, um, event for this particular group of people to have back? Yeah. I mean, I would say not soon enough um, for me personally. Um, my husband can attest to my first COVID-19 related tears were when March Madness was canceled. So, I mean, I certainly grieve the loss of a lot of events. I mean, weddings for all of you in the class of 2020, um, so many events that you've lost and graduations and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think first Sporting events. I, I certainly don't see like a, a federal, you know, ban or anything like that. But I think it will be local and league-based decisions. Um, you know, there's. I think there's sort of two levels, right? There's the safety of the athletes and making sure that they could compete in a in a safe way, and then there's the crowds um, and the fans. And so, you know, I could see for different sports, like they're talking about with Major League Baseball, you know, starting and having the competition, but without. Um, fans in the stands um, to just prevent that opportunity for spread. Um, and, and, you know, fortunately, we live in a digital age where we can at least watch remotely, but I certainly could see that that sort of being the, the phase in with starting sports first, but then adding the in-person crowds later. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Meg. Um, last but certainly not least, the next few questions will be for Bridget, focused around nonprofit work for, um, for COVID-19. Um, so first question is, what is the most effective role for philanthropy broadly to play in this crisis? Um, yeah, so I think to, to the point of nonprofit, I mean, the, the world that I'm sitting in is, is a kind of a hybrid. Some of it is nonprofit. Obviously, the Gates Foundation is the largest private foundation in the world. But in our office, Bill does many different kinds of investments that sort of run the gamut, right? Um, in, for instance, the climate work, which is different than what we're talking about, um, is not a non-for-profit for a variety of reasons, but I just want to make it clear that I'm not fully in the non-profit sector, but I'll, I'll do my best to address that along with other things. Um, you know, I think the, the most important role that, that philanthropy can play um, is to be a catalyst, you know, to take 
to take chances, not, not unsafe chances, not risky chances, but to experiment and explore a lot of different things that you don't necessarily want your taxpayer dollars going against. But you can use philanthropy as a way to explore um, both uh, science, medicine opportunities, uh, what works in education, uh, what doesn't work. You can explore and experiment a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, and you can get some of the things that prove to be worthy candidates or worthy considerations for scaling. You can, you can say, hey, this, this worked pretty well. Um, let's, let's give it a try. Um, it can also help you accelerate things. So, for instance, when you think about the government, um, you know, the government has a, a, an order of magnitude larger budget than any private philanthropy or even all the high net worth individuals put together. Um, but that needs to be safe money. That means needs to be money that taxpayers are making choices about. Um, and philanthropy, I think, can help um, help accelerate ideas that might be good or help accelerate saying that is not a path we should go down, nor is it a path that we should ever spend uh, taxpayer dollars on. So, um, you know, I think philanthropy, while it's coming under a lot of fire right now, um, you know, if done well, um, allows us to get to better solutions faster and allows us to avoid wasting money um, either at the state or the federal level. <clears throat> Got it. And within the COVID-19 response, where is Gates Ventures focusing to fight and support efforts to stem the pandemic? Uh, it's basically three, three areas. Um, so far, we've, we've put uh, just over $300 million um, into various COVID-related interventions, um, and it falls into a few different categories. The first is just the local response. I mean, uh, my office uh, is about a mile away from the Life Care Center in Kirkland, Washington, where we had the, the massive outbreak um, that really kicked off the pandemic in, in the United States. Um, and so we saw a um, dramatic surge um, and we saw, you know, the ERs and the ICUs get full very quickly. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a sort of a, a scary thing. Um, but interestingly enough, two years ago, Bill had decided to fund what was called at the time the Seattle flu study, um, because two years ago, uh, he thought, wow, if we could learn a little bit about what happens with seasonal flu and how that moves around the community, we might learn some things about how to, how to help in, in a more extreme case of a pandemic. And so, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot has been talked about in the media about his 2015 TED Talk, where he basically said we're not ready for for a next for the next epidemic and and at the time and I worked with him on that talk at the time the the hope was that we would we would help influence um, some policymakers and elected officials to really think seriously about um, what needed to be done and what could be done to help put us in a better position um, we we were starting to see the dismantling of some things that we thought were pretty important in terms of helping um, maintain public safety but. Unfortunately, uh, you know, not much was heated in that regard. But the Seattle flu study, back to that, you know, he put about 12, 20 million dollars. Very, very smart epidemiologists, virologists, um, data modelers, and so we were able to see uh, in in about the third week of January what was happening um, in Seattle, um, and we were we were able to see the first you know uh, uh, case that was not related to uh, any travel to Wuhan, and so. You know, uh, I sort of shudder to think where we would be now if we hadn't had that, um, you know, kind of early warning, um, which allowed us to understand that there was definitely community spread. Um, and so that was that's one area that he has put. He and Melinda have put um, money in. The the second big bucket um, is just in accelerating vaccine and therapeutics. So um, again, you may have heard him talk in the media about the fact that. You know, um, and I'll echo both what what Kelly and Kendall said about the difficulty of the vaccine work because you have a you have a few different components here. One, you have a novel virus that is you know we don't understand, and we keep learning new things every week. You have a situation where um, it you know the one of the most vulnerable populations, not the only, but one of them is is sort of elderly um, folks, and making a vaccine work in that in that demographic is. Um, even more difficult. Um, and then I think lastly, the fact that, you know, let's say we get a good candidate and it runs through trials and there's some level of acceleration, but at the end of the day, you still need to make 7 billion doses of that thing. 
Um, and so that's something that humanity has never done. Um, and, and then you, if we think we saw some bottlenecks with testing, wow, um, you know, suddenly we'll be in a situation where there won't be glass vials that are needed, there won't be very basic parts of the process. Um, and then you'll be faced with the challenge of not only the supply chain and then ultimately the delivery. Um, so, uh, so he cares a lot about, um, about how, what role can he and Melinda play in helping accelerate that and whether that's spending billions of their own money um, to, to build um, manufacturing capacity. Right now I think, and I'll let the medical professionals on the call correct me, but I think we've got about seven reasonable candidates um, which based on a meeting I was in yesterday, it sounds like maybe two or three of those are looking pretty good. Um, but even so, then you'll find us, like I said, in a situation where we need to build manufacturing capacity. And so again, um, the Gates Foundation and Bill and Melinda personally will do everything they can to make sure whether that's building out facilities and making sure they're ready to go um, ahead of time so that there's no time wasted between when we have a good, a good vaccine and we need to get it, um, you know, get it developed and then out to everyone. So that's the second big, big bucket. And then the third is something that they, which was the reason they started their foundation um, 20 years ago, which was basically that they believe that, you know, every life has equal value and it shouldn't matter where you're born. Um, it should matter that you have an opportunity, that you have a chance to live and then decide what you want to do with that lived life. Um, and health is, is maybe the most fundamental building block for that. So when they started the foundation, the, the goal was to make sure that, again, no matter where you were born, that you had a shot. Um, and so that a big part of that work has been focused on going to some of these, what we call LMICs, low and middle income countries, um, places like Africa, places like South Asia, where you have um, extremely poor health systems that are not uh, well-funded by their local governments and that are lacking in a lot of the very most basic um, needs. And so um, what Bill and Melinda are currently very worried about, in addition to what we're seeing happen here in the States, um, we're very worried about what's gonna happen in Africa, what's gonna happen in some of these places where, again, you don't have some of the basics and social distancing is not an option for a daily wage worker who needs to um, you know, get paid that day because that is, that is the only way to feed his or her kids. So, um, you know, there's a lot of concern about what's going to happen. And there's a lot of mystery still. We haven't seen some of the case rates that we thought we would at this point. We don't know why. And, and I think we're all very desperate to figure out why so that we can help to ensure some of those things are, um, you know, there's, there's doubling down on what can be most helpful. Um, so that's broadly the three kind of big areas of investment um, for Bill and Melinda. Great. So my last question for Bridget before I start to open it up to the group for questions, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced over the last three months? Um, well, you know, there have been a few. I, I would say um, to keep it short so that there's enough time for everybody to ask questions. It, I, it's really difficult to see um, a global health crisis um, be politicized. And I think that that is, that is really challenging. Um, and I think it's happening on all sides. Um, so I'm not, you know, not going to point fingers, but it is very difficult that there's a level of, a, of fear and emotion um, and, and politics that is overlaid, I think, across this whole thing that I think has clouded um, some response efforts or it's clouded some public education efforts or it's clouded some, um, you know, understanding broadly about how we can move forward in a constructive way. Um, and then I think it's sort of a cousin of that is this, this the disinformation and misinformation um, that is so readily available for people. Um, and I think Kendall said, you know, listen to the experts, listen to the scientists, go to the CDC website, but don't, don't uh, sort of get down the rabbit hole of your feed um, because it, it really won't serve you well. Um, and I think that because there is so much fear, um, you know, it, it is tempting to um, it is tempting to find a place that that might uh, kind of speak to that fear a little bit. Um, but I, I would resist that um, because I don't I just don't think it's going to either make you feel better or lead you to good information. Got it. Thank you so much, Bridget. So now we have a few minutes um, for questions from the audience to avoid everyone talking over each other. 
if you could just send me a message on Zoom chat that you have a question, I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask the panel member the question. Avery Wright, you're up. <laughs> My question is for Bridget. Um, in the Gates Foundation's opinion in terms of the economic impact and how reopening has gone, does he? do they believe that it's too aggressive, too conservative and what they think the long-term economic um, kind of impact may be? Yeah. Hi, Avery. I love your aunt. <laughs> She's one of my favorites. She's so great. Yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> she's amazing. Um, so, I get, so basically your question is, you know, what do Bill and Melinda see about sort of the reopening and what that, what that means economically, how you do it in a safe, fair way? Is that sort of the gist? Yeah. How, how important is the economic impact in, in their opinion? And do they, I guess, agree with the path that we're currently taking, or would they be more conservative or more aggressive? Yeah, well, they would both be more conservative. Um, I think that one of the things that they both have said over and over again is that it's an artificial distinction to say, let's do what's best for the economy, and then let's over here do what's best for health. They're so interlinked, and every citizen that dies is an economic, economic hit. Um, to this country beyond whatever the personal toll and the emotional toll of that death is. And so you really can't split them apart and evaluate in their mind what, what makes sense. And so I think the, the other piece of this that is too easily overlooked is the notion that we've already been through an insane amount of economic devastation um, in the last you know, 60 to 90 days. It's, it's staggering, 33 million Americans out of work, right? And so We've, we've been through that pain. And now if we open up too quickly, we're just gonna do it again. So you have a choice to either take it twice and protract things and ultimately, I think in our view, um, you know, raise that cost of, of reopening ultimately. Um, but I think that a conservative approach, while it is painful economically, if you can do it one time and have it work well, I think ultimately, the notion is that we'll be better off. Um, the only other piece I'll say quickly about reopening is it, I think one of the things that they would both really lobby for if they were on the call is to, um, to think about it in a systematic way and to identify what are the things that have been shut down that are so important to society. Um, not that are fun, but are so critical. And so if we were orient, orienting ourselves around priorities in terms of opening up, I think the first thing we'd be looking at is education and probably K through eight, because that as a mom of a, of a wild third grade boy, like the distance learning notion is, I mean, it's kind of laughable um, at the high school level. And certainly where you guys are, you, you're mature, you're responsible, you're motivated, you're, you're self-directed. So you'll, you'll do the right things, but the cost on sort of that younger um, loss of education, I think is pretty extreme. So well, why are we in a situation where we're not looking at how do we reopen schools in a careful way? And, and let's, I mean, my hair hasn't been colored in a long time, but we can wait on that and we can wait on some of the other things that we all really miss. Um, so I think a strategy for reopening and identifying what are the things that are the most important things um, versus what maybe should be waiting a little bit longer for. Awesome. Callie Simpkins has a question. Um, are you on? Hey, Libs. Can you guys hear me? I don't know if my headphones are working. Okay. Um, first, thanks to everyone for doing this. Libs, thanks for organizing it. It's been great. Um, my question is for Meg. Um, it's, it's stemming more because my, my sister actually owns a gym and, and got a PPP loan throughout this, um, this process. And, you know, it's, it's fine, too, if we don't know, like, the technical uh, ways that this works. But I was just curious. You broke out a little bit for me when you were talking about it being a forgivable, um, a forgivable loan for small businesses that get PPP loans. But do you know anything about, like, the technical way that that works? And, like, you know, if they have to repay it, what portion um, needs to go towards, like, the payroll versus, like, your other expenses? in order for it to be forgiven just if you have any more technical details around how that works and you know if and when they'll have to pay that back um i'm just curious about that yeah sure hi Kelly. it's been a long time hey. um, <laughs> <It has. laughs> in very different circumstances but, yeah um, in libby's sister's apartment in in uh uh new york city actually yeah, that's right 
Um, yeah, so, you know, on the technical side, um, again, you know, some of the implementation of some of these big programs um, has been bumpy and frankly, the like long term rulemaking is still to be determined. But so PPP has a 75-25 rule currently. So 75% of the forgivable loan has to go to payroll. So paying employees expenses and 25% can go to capital or mortgage or you know, keeping literally the lights on electricity, that sort of thing. So there's a 75-25 rule currently. There's some talk about changing the 75-25 ratio um, for businesses who laid off employees before PPP was passed. Um, and you know now those employees are on unemployment. I talked a little bit about how unemployment has gotten more generous. And so sometimes those employees don't want to come back. They're actually making more right. money in unemployment. So there's some of those technical things um, that they're, they're working on some rulemaking fixes for. As far as... Um, you know, what percentage of the loan is forgivable. That's somewhat based on the terms that, that the particular loan was negotiated under. So I can't speak specifically to that, but um, they do have to, you know, show that the money went to, at, at this point, 75% payroll and 25% other expenses. Um, and I'm happy to connect with you offline. About yeah, specifics. I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to let one more person ask a question because I know that we're coming up to 5 p.m., but Evan Cohen. So this question's open to anyone, but I was just curious. Obviously, everyone's probably unsure, and it depends on events over the next couple months, but what do you see as the most likely scenario regarding college students and, like, returning for the academic, like, the fall academic semester? I don't think, in terms of Duke, hasn't made a decision yet. Um, in terms of what they're going to do about that. Um, I know that the California state schools, if you've been following the news, they're not planning to come back this fall. Um, you know, that's going to have a, for this particular group that obviously has an impact on our fall sports teams. But um, at this time, I think they're still looking at a state by state basis in terms of what the situation is like. And, um, you know, it's certainly a balance students as a, um, Someone else had mentioned, you know, college age learners can probably do a little bit better of job of doing this virtually than our younger students. Um, but I don't think, I think a lot of colleges are trying to wait to make those decisions. Medical students are back, at least at Duke. Um, I saw one in the OR uh, Friday. Um, so they're back. Um, and a lot of graduate schools or professional schools, I think, are coming back if they need a hands-on component. But I don't know the answer to that for college. And someone else might know more specific to their state. No, I just to sort of echo what Kendall is saying again. It's it's just going to vary by by area. So like while med students are back at Duke, they're definitely not back here. Um, Harvard Medical School, I think, is probably one of the first. But they just came out saying that their first year medical students, the incoming students are going to be all virtual until at least January of 2021. Um, so, you know, I, I am hopeful. I, you know, like everyone was saying, we know how important the fall is to all the people on this chat. And we're super hopeful for, for not only you guys, but all other student athletes and just students in general. We want, everyone wants to get back to normal. And I just think everyone's trying to do it as safely as possible. And I think hopefully within the next few weeks, even month or two, it's going to be a little bit more clear, um, but, but still a little bit up in the air for right now. Got it. Well, this wraps up the panel, but I do want to let Robbie Church say a few words to conclude the call, but thank you, everyone, and thank you to the panel members. Ladies, this was awesome. One of the best things we've ever done. I um, want to really give a shout out to Libby, uh, uh, Lane Goodman. I know you guys, this is your baby. You guys put this together. You got the panel. You brought everybody in. You organized the things. Uh, really, really, you two, thank you so much for doing this for us. We're all so fortunate to have this information, to receive this information too. So Kendall, Kelly, Meg, Bridget, uh, fantastic job, ladies. Fantastic job from all of you. Um, we have really appreciate this. Uh, Meg, you are definitely an honorary uh, DWS member now. We will send, we will send you shirt to you, um, but we do appreciate you and everybody else too. Um, this was fantastic for all our players, for all the alumni, to bring everybody and anybody else that joined this. Um, but thank you so much for putting this together and letting us be part of this. Thanks thank so you, much. Libby.
Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.